On behalf of this family, I'd like to thank you for being here today. I'm Pastor Chris Balcom, and this is a real honor for me to serve this family today. Your presence here today means more to them than you probably realize. Uh, today's a difficult day for them, and you being here to show love and comfort to them means so much. But in the days ahead, they're still going to need you, so please write cards, make phone calls, visit this family if that's possible to let them know that you're continuing to think about them and pray for them. Would you bow your heads with me as we open in a word of prayer? Precious Father, Lord, I thank you today, Lord, for the life of Ray Upperman, Father. All the things that you accomplished through him in the 73 years that you gave him here on this earth. Uh, for this family, Father, and uh, the tremendous amount of people in this family, Lord, and we just thank you for all of them and pray that you would just draw them closer together as a family and father that you would help them to lean on each other during this time of loss be with us today be with each one that shares today and may we not only uh, remember him and honor his life but but honor you as the creator in jesus name i pray amen we're going to listen to a song called somewhere over the rainbow so listen to this song
beautiful song. I want to invite uh, Bruce to come and share and then following him if there's others that would like to come then um, you can do so. Yeah I felt like I had to do this for my dad. Growing up, my dad. Uh, he was always there for me. Never left me, picked me up when everything was, you know, my life was going a little wrecked. He's never left my side. And he's touched me in so many ways, like he's probably touched all you guys in so many ways. And. He's going to be missed, and I have a hope in my heart that one day I'll see him again, and I'm going to hang on to that, and I know my uncle and my grandma's going to be there waiting for me too. That's my piece. My dad is a very special person. and. I love him very much. I'll keep it brief. Someone else? Yeah, I told Caitlin I would uh, come up here and say something for her on her behalf. Obviously, Steve was an absolutely amazing man, as we all know. <clears throat> Anyone that's come into this family knows you're automatically a part of the family the second you step in the door. Um, I know that. I know Denise knows that. Everybody that came in as, as son-in-laws or daughter-in-laws or anything like that, just such an accepting man, and everybody was always there. So it was just great to have him as a father figure, as well as my own father, knowing that based on their examples, the father that I can be for the twins on the way. And I know every time that uh, I hear a phone ring, and if it's that Samsung ring, I'm just going to hear, hey, buddy, <laughs> as he would always say. So uh, the one thing he would ask me all the time, uh, which is important to my life, which he you know, dove in straightforward, um, he would always say, how's the team? You guys going to win a state championship this year? I'd say, well, the girls are. Well, what about the boys? I don't, I don't know. Weddington's pretty good. Ah, you're going to beat Weddington. Um, so for me, uh, right before, <clears throat> right before he, he went, we, uh, we did it, man. We, we beat Weddington. We finally toppled them. So I know he was proud of that and was excited to watch that um, while he was in the hospital. So um, just an amazing man. I know we're all going to miss him, but so many ways that we can honor him with the things that we do on a daily basis. So. Anyone else have something they'd like to share? Uncle Steve was like a second dad to me, especially after my dad passed away. He was 
always the first guy I called when I had good news to share or needed some advice and just a tremendous man. One of my fondest memories of him is when Amy and I were still fairly young, newly married, kids were young, didn't have two pennies to rub together. And he and Aunt Karen invited us for Christmas one year and we drove to his house. He told Amy and I to told us to get in the car, drove us to, drove us to the Toys R Us store and said, fill up a cart for your kids. And that year, if it wasn't for that, those kids wouldn't have had a Christmas. And that's the kind of man that Uncle Steve was, and I'm going to miss him. Anyone else? My name is Bill Causey, and um, I knew Steve uh, through the Navy. So most of the children and grandkids, especially, and great-grandkids would be four-year time, except for the Bruce and Steve. I, I knew them when they were growing up. But I met Steve. <clears throat> we served on the U.S. Uh, Oak Hill, LSD-7. And this was in 65 through about 68 or so. And um, I had been on deck force and then got in dispersing. And if you don't know what dispersing is, that's where you pay the crew. So that was a pretty good job. And um, <clears throat> Steve came on board and I met him. And we needed a striker. That's what you call the person that's coming in to learn the job into this person, and Steve had applied for it. So um, he came in there, and of course, his personality and all that was uh, was was unique and amazing. So we <coughs> he got the job, and he and I worked together for I guess a couple of years before I I actually got out of the service then, and Steve then took over my place. But during that time. Um, we played softball together. Of course, he was always, you know, in athletics, and I was too, and enjoyed that. We had our big rivalries between Ohio State and Georgia. And, uh, of course, he was a big Ohio State fan. And um, after I got out of the service, um, I did go to visit him a couple times, and I came here, up here, and saw him a, a few times and stayed in touch with him a good bit. And we kept talking about, this is where sometimes we have to follow through. We think we're going to get to see people, and we keep putting it off, and we don't do it. And I said, I knew Steve liked to play golf. He loved to play golf. And so I had started not too long ago. I'm horrible. I always said if I played with anybody I could beat, I'd never want to play with them again because they'd be so bad. So anyway, I kept calling them. We kept talking about it. I never did get around to it, though, and I do regret that. So that's something to keep in mind. Don't put off things. If you're going to go visit somebody or talk to them, make that trip. Make sure you stay in touch with them. But I will say this. Steve was always, always so much fun to be around. We always had a great time. He always was energized, had, you know, he always had some plan. And sometimes we do things on the spur of the moment. One time I remember when we were out in California, we'd gotten together at the house, and a well, in the house apartment. Barely could afford an apartment back then, Navy days. And as a lot of you all know, he liked to make pizza. And I think some of the 
children, maybe even the grandchildren have gotten them, you know, taken up that. And he'd come over to the house, make pizza, and so we're there at the house one evening, and we're like, it was New Year's Eve, we're like, hey, let's go to the Rose Bowl. And I, he might have brought it up, I'm not sure, it's late at night, so we all hopped in a car and went to Pasadena. And we got there so early in the morning that we were able to really get a good spot. So that was, that was very memorable. Um, about Steve, though, he had such a big heart. Help anybody. And uh, that's one thing. It, he was just always upbeat when I was around him. In the Navy, afterwards, always. And uh, I hope everybody takes that home with them. What a tremendous guy he was. And I will really miss him. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I want to share a story with you today. Um, I, I've never met Steve, but what an incredible person sounds like he was and just looking at his wife while I was sitting here and hearing all these people tell the stories and I can't imagine what she's feeling today um, to lose the person that knows you better than anybody um, that's got to be difficult and for you kids um, losing your dad um, I, I my heart goes out to you. Uh, sounds like he was an amazing person. I don't know where you were when you got the news that he had passed, but you probably will never forget that moment when the phone rang or when that moment came and maybe you were with him when he took his last breath. I, I don't know. But in the Old Testament, there's a story about a guy that got up thinking it was going to be like any other day. And his whole life changed that day because everything that he knew as comfortable in his life was gone. And the person I'm talking about in the Old Testament is a guy by the name of Job. And Job woke up one day, and, and Job was a, he was a holy, righteous man. He loved the Lord, lived his life for the Lord. He had a great wife. He had seven children that he just adored. He owned a lot of livestock. He had servants. He was wealthy. He was respected. He was a great man. And everybody loved him. But just like you received a phone call or somebody brought you a message and told you about your husband or your dad. Somebody brought some news to Job. And the news was that everything he had was gone. These raiders had come in and they had stolen all of his livestock, taken his servants. His children had all burned up in a fire. They were all together in a house having a, a fellowship time together and the house caught on fire and they all burned up. And so four different messengers brought more and more bad news. And what it was left with was his wife and some memories and some friends. And that's sort of where you guys are today. Your life has changed. And you've got to decide what you're going to do with today. How do I move forward? And that's hard. It's really hard. You're going to need to allow yourself to grieve. Allow yourself to cry, to wail if you need to. But let me tell you what Job did. He had the same choices that, that you have. And here's what those choices were. Job could have chosen to live in the past. 
And I, I've seen folks do that when they receive something like this happen in their life, especially a, a mother who's lost a child. She'll lock herself up in that child's bedroom and never change anything in that room and just become a hermit. She's afraid to try anything new because she's afraid she'll forget. But Job didn't do that. Job could have chosen to listen to his friends. He had some friends that came along and they were trying to help him by giving him some advice and and family, there's going to be some people that's going to come to you over the next several days or weeks even and try to give you advice on how to move forward. And there's going to be times when they're going to say something that they, their intentions are good, but they really don't have a clue how you feel. Often I'll be in a visitation line and I'll hear somebody say to a woman who's lost her husband and She'll say, I know exactly how you feel because she's lost her husband. But in reality, we all feel differently. And so there's no way anybody can relate to exactly how you feel. But Job's friends came along and they said, Job, um, buddy, this is your fault. You've sinned against God. God's angry with you and he's punishing you by allowing all this stuff in your life to go away. But that wasn't true because the very first chapter of the book of Job says he was a holy, righteous man. But had Job chosen to listen to that, he could have lived the rest of his life confused, trying to figure out what did I do to make God so angry at me? The Lord taking Steve is, is not punishment for any of you. But Job could have listened to that. Job could have listened to his wife. His wife came along and said, Honey, why don't you just curse God and die? In other words, get mad at God. Now, I've seen that happen too. I did a service recently where I, I walked into the, the family room during visitation, and I, the family, just like you guys, had never met me before that, that day. and there was this man and his sister was young and she had overdosed and passed away and and so she was in her 30s and her brother was so angry at god so i walked up standing waiting to talk to him but he was with everything in him just looking upward and cursing god uh, the look on his face was pretty amazing when I introduced myself as the pastor. But Job could have done that. And maybe some of you are feeling that way. You're angry at God, but this isn't God's fault. We, we live in a body that gets sick and a body that, that will die. But Job didn't do that either. Job could have also chosen to just live the rest of his life right there at that crossroads and not live in the past, not listen to his friends, not listen to his wife. He could have just lived confused. And, and I've seen that happen too where folks will just try to drown their sorrow with either drugs or alcohol so they don't have to feel the, the hurt. But Job didn't do that either. What he did do was the right thing. But it's probably not something you're going to be able to do today. What it says Job did is this. In chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Then Job arose, he tore his robe, and he shaved his head, which is that outward expression of grief, just like we wear black to a funeral today. Back in that day, that's what they would do. They would shave their head and they would tear their robe. It says he fell to the ground and he worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there. The Lord has gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord 
In all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. How do you do that? How do you praise the Lord for taking your loved one away? But that's what Job did. And like I said, you're not going to be able to do that now, but at least I don't think you're going to be able to. But I hope in the days ahead you will because for a person, just like his son said, he said, I, I have the hope of seeing my dad again someday. With all my heart, I believe there's a place called heaven. I know there was a man named Jesus Christ who was God in the flesh that came and he is the only God. And I know that he came to earth to make a way for us to have eternal life. Our, our great-great-grandparents, Adam and Eve, made a mistake in the Garden of Eden. And because of their mistake, we've all been bitten by that thing called sin. And now because of that, we live with that nature to make choices. Some right choices and some wrong ones. And so God saw that we needed a way for redemption, so he sent his son Jesus to the cross of Calvary to provide us a way. Adam and Eve gave dominion of the earth over to Satan. The Lord took that back. Matthew chapter 28 says, All power and all authority are his now. But until we leave this earth, we're still going to battle that old nature. I don't know if y'all ever watched Fred Flintstone on TV. You remember those episodes where there was a little devil sitting on one shoulder, a little angel sitting on the other? And Fred was listening to the two of them trying to decide what he was going to do. That's not far from scriptural. The Bible says we have the inner man that's the deciding factor in our life. And we have the old man, which is Satan. We have the new man, which is the Holy Spirit of God that lives within us. And the old man's always battling, trying to get us to follow him. But for that person who has surrendered their life to the Lord and believes in him, there's a place called heaven. And for Steve, that would mean that John 14 says he's gained a brand new home today. One that far exceeds anything mankind could even build, perfect in every way. 1 Corinthians 15 says he's gained a brand new body today. This corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. A body that will never get sick, a body that will never die. Revelation chapter 21, John, the only disciple of Christ, not martyred for the cause of Christ, but was rather exiled to an island called Patmos. He said it's a place where there's no more tears, that the Lord himself will wipe away the final tears we'll ever shed again. And it's a place where there's no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, no more separation. All those things have passed away and everything's been made brand new. And it's all by one word, and it's the word grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, I'm going to close with this. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that it's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works. Now what that simply means is this. At some point in Steve's life, the Lord spoke to him. And all he had to do was say, yes, Lord. And then he became the Lord's workmanship. That word workmanship in the original Greek language means the Lord's masterpiece. So he's been working on him for a long time. 
And I know you want to say, that's my husband, that's my daddy, that's my grandpa, whatever relationship. And all those things are true. But ultimately, he belonged to the Lord. And so the Lord took him home. And it's all because of God's grace and his mercy. We're going to listen to the song Amazing Grace. Guy Penrod singing this song with the Gaither Vocal Band. So listen to this song and then I'll come back and close us in prayer and we'll make our way across the street to lay his earthly body to rest. pray with me. Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, this day. I'm thankful, Lord, for your amazing grace, for your mercy, for your love. Be with us now as we go across the street, Lord, and lay this earthly body to rest. 
draw this family closer together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand?